Hello and welcome to Serena Speaks and today we're going over chapter 11 of the BNF which is the eyes. So some of the sections and areas that are covered in this topic are ocular hypertension, uh, glaucoma, different antibacterials that can be used, dry eye conditions. I feel like it's a very straightforward topic so let's start off with what we can actually put in our eyes. So we can use ointments, drops, um, if we need a higher dose of a drug we can use an injection and we can even use lotions so for example sodium chloride 0.9% solution or water in the case of emergencies so if you've got any irritants in the eyes and it needs to be flushed out um, which is usually used as first aid treatment you can also get eye dispensers and um, some are available in the NHS and these are used mostly for children those that have um, that are visually impaired and for those um, who might have arthritis, for example. So eye drops. So just to say, whilst we're going through this video, I might be touching the area around my eyes. Um, I know that some people don't really like watching people touch their eyes, um, so I do apologise. But I won't actually be touching my eyes, just the area around it. Um, I'm very used to where I wear contact lenses. But in terms of drops, usually one drop is sufficient. And the way that you would tell the patient to place drop in is to pull down on their lower eyelid and this pocket that's being formed, that's where they need to aim the eye drop into. The more eye drops you use, the increase in systemic side effect. In terms of ointments, it's very similar, um, but it's actually beneficial if the patient blinks because then that helps spread the ointment across the eyes. Now, I mentioned side effects. These are highly variable, but for example, any of you who have taken chloramphenicol eye drops or um, have patients that have taken um, chloramphenicol eye drops, a lot of them will complain that as soon as they put the eye drop in, they can feel it go through the back of their throat and then they get this horrible, nasty taste of it. And that's called nasal drainage. And the way to help reduce this or minimise this is that when a drop is placed, the patient should press over here. This is called their lacrimal punctum. And by pressing here, you're reducing and um, minimising the nasal drainage going down basically. And of course, for those who are driving, make sure that their vision is clear and that it isn't impaired or blurred in any way. So in terms of injections, we can use the subconjunctival route for anti-infectives for corticosteroids. We can use the intravitreal route, so I actually going into the eye um, for antibacterials. And certain eye drops need to be pre prepared aseptically if they're to be used in injections. So these include dexamethasone, vancomycin, gentamicin, so that includes some of our high risk medicines. And very rarely patients do report um, or patients have reported corneal calcification when using phosphate um, based or phosphate containing drops. And this is because this is a risk of um, hyperparathyroidism. So the types of questions that they like to ask with regards to eye drops um, in exams is your knowledge on when something should be discarded. So when it's a multiple application containers and you're using it for domiciliary use or home use, it should be discarded up to four weeks. If you're using it in hospital, discard within one week. And they like to, in general with extemporous preparations, like to test your knowledge on what is known as recently prepared and freshly prepared and eye drops that are being extemporaneously prepared fall into this. So if something's freshly prepared, that means that it should not be made up um, more than 24 hours before it's going to be used. If something's recently prepared, that means that it should be used up to four weeks because after four weeks, it's more likely for it to deteriorate. And if a patient is using eye drops in both their eyes, then ideally they should use a separate container to minimise the risk of contamination. And if a person is a contact lens wearer, then they should use preservative free drops. Now, in terms of contact lenses, I quite like this section because as I mentioned, I wear contact lenses. There are two main types. There's your hard um, gas permeable lenses and there's your soft lenses, which is usually hydrogel. And um, if a person keeps their contacts in for too long, and this is like too, too long, they're at an increased, increased risk of keratitis. So if a patient doesn't comply, then they're at a risk of conjunctivitis and ulcerated keratitis. And some patients can even get this condition. I've really tried practicing how to say it. 
it's just not coming out of my mouth. But this form of keratitis, it um, can be painful, it can even be sight threatening to patients who don't clean and disinfect their lenses properly. properly. They really make contact lenses sound appealing. So particularly with our soft contact lenses, with our hydrogels, drugs can accumulate in them and cause adverse reactions. So an example is rifampicin, rifampicin which is used for TB, and it can colour bodily fluids, so usually an orangey colour, so your urine and your tears. And if you can imagine you're wearing a contact lens, that oranginess is just going to accumulate in there, cause those adverse reactions, it's not going to be very good. Other examples are drugs that decrease lacrimation, so lacrimation tear flow, such as antihistamines, um, antimuscarinics, because if you think about it, it's going to make the eyes really, really dry. Also drugs that increase lacrimation, such as ephedrine, or even um, drugs, those that decrease the blink rate. So again, antihistamines, antiolytics. So in general, if a person's on um, any of these particular medicines uh, or even different eye drops that they might be using, eye ointments, take the contact lenses out before you're placing the preparation in and then just avoid wearing it during treatment. And like I mentioned, if you're on like sulfazalazine, rifampicin, even some estrogens, um, it can affect contact lens wearers. And ointments shouldn't be used um, in, well, they shouldn't be used when a patient's wearing contact lenses either. So again, take the contact lenses out before putting the ointment in and just avoid wearing them during treatment. Moving on to allergic and inflammatory conditions. So inflammation, we can use corticosteroid eye drops or topical or corticosteroids for 24 to 48 hours. So these could um, these could contain betamethasone, prednisolone, dexamethasone, but something like Maxidex, which contains dexamethasone, shouldn't be used for under two year olds. Um, there's some of the problems with using corticosteroids, though. Topical corticosteroids are, for example, red eye syndrome and unconfirmed diagnosis could be a herpes simplex virus. This could then lead to corneal ulceration, even impairment in vision. Could also get steroid glaucoma or steroid cataracts with prolonged use. For conditions such as macular edema, we can use intravitreal implants, which contain, for example, dexamethasone. And um, with there, you can get combination products. So an um, anti-infective with um, a corticosteroid because the corticosteroid will help in the inflammation, the anti-infective with the infection. Um, we can also get other anti-inflammatory preparations for topical treatment um, that could contain an, anti an antihistamine such as oloptidine or sodium chromoglycate, which can be used for allergic conjunctivitis. There's also diclofenac sodium eye drops, which could be used for seasonal allergic conjunctivitis and NSAID eye drop preparations because NSAIDs um, help with inflammation. So we can use them in, after surgery, for example, after laser eye surgery. Some of the side effects include burning, stinging of the eyes and that horrible bitter taste as well. And with a condition such as uveitis, um, we can use an antimuscarinic such as atropine. But in patients who have darkly pigmented irises such as mine, we're a lot more resistant to pupillary dilation. So use in caution with these patients because you want to avoid overdose. So dry eye conditions. So in patients who have chronic soreness of the eye, um, usually associated with abnormal or reduction in tear production, they can benefit through tear replacement, um, tear replacement therapy or um, giving pilocarpine by mouth. We also have hypermellose. Hypermellose is great um, in those that have tear deficiency. With hypermellose though, um, sometimes the strength isn't written and so it's really important to double check with the prescriber which strength they intended. In general, if they haven't written a strength, it usually means that they want you to dispense the lowest strength available, but it's always best to double check. And you can instill it every hour, hourly for, um, for relief. But what if somebody doesn't want to have to keep instilling something every hour? What if they want something where they don't have to instill it that frequently? Well, we can give them carbomers. So for example, biscuitiers or blephagel, and these cling onto the eye surface and you can apply them, say, four times a day. 
You also have poly polyvenyl alcohol, and this can increase persistence of tear film. And you get sodium chloride, 0.9% drops. And these are known as comfort drops in contact lens wearers to help facilitate with the removal of the lens. And you can also get ointments containing paraffin, which can really help with lubricate the eye. They can cause visual disturbances though, so they're best to be applied before bedtime. So in terms of eye infections, um, blepharitis and conjunctivitis can be caused by a staphylococci infection, um, keratitis and endophthalmitis, a hard, difficult word, which I practice to say, and I'm very proud that I got that word right. So keratitis and endophthalmitis can be caused by bacterial, fungal or viral infections. In terms of bacterial blepharitis, usually treatment is with an antibacterial eye ointment and systemic antibiotics such as tetracycline for over three months. Um, with bacterial conjunctivitis, we can use eye drops or eye ointments. So with the drops, over the, so both of which we can sell over the counter. Eye drops come as chloramphenicol 0.5% um, drops in a maximum pack size of 10 ml. The ointment comes as chloramphenicol 1% ointment in a maximum pack size of 4 grams. What's worth noting uh, is that with the eye drops, you usually apply one drop every two hours until infection is controlled. And it's important to carry on using the drops 48 hours after it's all healed. Um, with the eye ointment, if you're using drops during the day, then use the eye ointment once at night time. But if the ointment is just being used alone, then use it three to four times a day. Um, in terms of endophthalmitis, we would do intravitreal administration of antimicrobials and potentially even surgery such as a vitrectomy. Other antibacterials that could be used are, for example, quinolones such as ciprofloxacin, which can be used for corneal ulcers, or even um, aminoglycosides such as gentamicin. But remember, a big side effect of gentamicin is autotoxicity and nephrotoxicity, so just use in caution, just be careful. That was antibacterials. In terms of antifungals, fungal infections of the cornea are quite rare, but risk could be increased with increase in age, debility, immunosuppression, and if it spreads to the bloodstream, then a patient can contract metastatic endophthalmitis. In terms of antivirals, so with herpes simplex or ophthalmic zoster, the treatment of choice would be a cyclophyr eye ointment. And slow releasing ocular implants might be inserted surgically to treat immediate sight threatening CMV retinitis. So in the BNF has a really short section on eye procedures, mygiatics and cycloplegics. So, so very briefly, antimuscarinics dilate pupils. We have short acting mydratics and long acting mydratics. An example of the short acting is tropicamide and that can last um, up to four to six hours. An example of our long acting is atropine, and that can act for up to seven days. Then we've got post-operative um, pain and inflammation and the drops that can be used in that. So inflammation, think of NSAIDs, our diclofenac sodium, our nepophanic, um, they can all be used in the prophylaxis and treatment of, say, laser eye surgery. There's also ferroxine that can be used in the prophylaxis of endophthalmitis in cataracts. And we can also use um, local anaesthetics when it comes to pain and inflammation. So you know something here is a local anaesthetic because it will end in the word cane. So examples are oxybrupocaine and proximetocaine. And ox um, proximetocaine um, in particular, it's associated with less stinging and can be used in children. So now we're going to talk about glaucoma and ocular hypertension. And last but not least, we'll go on to retinal disorders. So Ocular hypertension. If a person has this, they're at higher risk of getting primary open angle glaucoma. In terms of glaucoma, a person might have impairment of their visual field, they'll have cupping of the optic disc, they'll have an increase in intraocular pressure. And one of the more common types of glaucoma is primary angle um, glaucoma, open angle glaucoma. Now, what does this actually mean? Well, for this, we're going to use a box of tissues because it involves the trabecular meshwork, which is tissue that is located in the base of the cornea. So we're going to imagine this is our trabecular meshwork. We also have something called aqueous humour, and that's the fluid that fills the space in between the lens and the cornea. So now, I would use water, but I would make a mess, and 
my mother wouldn't be very happy. So we're going to use our imaginations and pretend that this is water. I know, lots of imagination is going to be needed, but this is our trabecular mesh work. This is our tissue. And in an ideal world, the aqueous humour would be going through it and everyone would be happy days. In the case of primary open angle glaucoma, that aqueous humour is being restricted in going in the trabecular mesh work. And then that's what causes that primary open angle glaucoma. So what treatments would we use? So first line would be a beta blocker or a prostaglandin. Or we can use others if, um, say, a beta blocker isn't working on its own um, or prostaglandin isn't working on its own or they're just ineffective on their own. Um, so examples include sympathomimetics, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors or myotics. So let's look at a few examples of each. So beta blockers, they decrease intraocular pressure and we know that beta blockers end in ol, so timolol, levobunolol, le levo yeah, levobunolol. Um, prostaglandins, they again decrease intraocular pressure. They will end the word prost, latanoprost, travaprost. Sympathomimetics, they are selective alpha-2 adrenoreceptor agonists. And an example is bromidine, bromonidine. Um, and we've got our carbonic anhydrous inhibitors. So these decrease intraocular pressure by reducing the amount of aqueous humour production. So by decreasing aqueous humor production, that in turn will decrease intraocular pressure. And an example is acetylzolamide, but that isn't really recommended long term. Another example is drulzolamide. So we can think of our um, carbonic anhydrous inhibitors and ending in the word mide. Acetylzolamide, drulzolamide, brinzolamide. Or we can use myotics. Now, an example is pilocarpine. This isn't really used in primary open angle glaucoma because of the side effects, but it is very effective and used in angle closure glaucoma and in secondary glaucomas. So on to our last section, retinal disorders. So there's two main types. There's macular degeneration and vitromacular traction. So with our macular um, degeneration, the main class of drugs that are used are vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors. If treatment is unresponsive for diabetic macular edema, then we would use fluosinolone acetate and that would be given via intravitreal injection. For our vitreomacular traction, the class of drugs that we would use are recombinant proteolytic enzymes, for, for example, ocriplasmin. And that's it. That's the eye section. Nice, short and sweet section. I think it's actually quite quite an interesting section. I, I particularly quite like this section. Um, and hopefully you've gained a better understanding of it. Um, when you think of glaucoma, I really hope you think of tissues now. Um, and I hope this video has helped with your understanding about eye conditions and eye disorders a bit more. If it has, then why not give us a like, share this video, subscribe for the latest information and join our Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash Serena Speaks. And until next time, good luck with your revision and happy revisings.